Recently, Tennessee pastor Greg Locke was on video as accusing the Seventh-day Sabbath of being a doctrine of demons and anybody who keeps it as being under the law. Is what he's saying factually correct? Is it really biblical? Let's talk about that today. But first, watch this clip from him so that we can get a little bit more context. Trying to tell people Jesus is going to come next week, I'm going to ask you to leave because I ain't fooling with your Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, law-abiding nonsense. I ain't messing with it. And let me just go one step further for all these seven-day Adventists that watch me for some reason and send me letters. You worship in the devil because you meet on Sunday. Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus became my Sabbath. And I'm here to tell you, I worship on the first day of the week because of the glory of the resurrection. I am not under the law of the Sabbath. Jesus said there will come a day. It doesn't matter when and it doesn't matter where, but it matters who you will worship. I'm telling you, Saturday worship as far as the law is concerned, is a demonic doctrine. Shut up and don't come at me with all that nonsense. You got to worship on Saturday because of the law. I'm not under the law, Scipio. I'm under the grace of the resurrected Savior. So his kingdom's going to come, and I don't know when, and I don't know how, and I've changed my theological position on all that pre-trib stuff, okay? And I don't care what you think about that neither. I ain't arguing with it. That's why I don't preach a lot on prophecy. Because for years I preached on it like I knew everything about it, got in the Bible and figured out I didn't know nothing about it except what the Baptist told me. Right? Uh, Y'all okay? Am I, am, I, am I talking good? His kingdom's coming. His kingdom's coming. His kingdom's coming. Just be ready. Okay. So, is the Sabbath a doctrine of demons? Well, we have to go back to the Bible to see. Now, let's start as is the best place in the beginning. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, God had created the world in six days. And his icing on the cake, his cherry on top, was the seventh day of the week. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, On the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Now, these words for rested translate more accurately to Sabbath. Uh, if we can turn the noun Sabbath into a verb, God Sabbathed on the Sabbath day. He rested. He gave us the example. Now, people may say, well, that's Old Testament. The Sabbath was just for the Jews. But in Genesis chapter 2, there, there were no Jews. There was just Adam and Eve. A lot of people see the sabbath as being part of the ceremonial law and we see the ceremonial law first introduced in genesis chapter 3. the bible says also for adam and his wife the lord god made tunics of skin and clothed them now in order to make clothing out of skin you have to kill an animal and so here we see this intimation this very strong intimation that god had instituted the ceremonial law at this point because there was a sin Galatians 3.19 says that the law, the ceremonial law, was added because of sin. So the whole feast day system, that didn't come about until after Adam and Eve sinned. But the Sabbath commandment was created before there was sin. We look in Exodus chapter 20. Let's turn there. And in the fourth commandment, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then it goes on and lists, uh, don't make anybody work for you. Don't work yourself. Don't do anything that you can do the other six days. Um, because uh, God created the earth and God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. So a lot of people will see, see the Sabbath wasn't mentioned until Exodus 20, but it's created in Genesis chapter 2, which means that if God created the seventh day, that means the Sabbath commandment was already there. And so uh, the Ten Commandments were there before the fall. So how could they be a doctrine of demons? Now, in Exodus chapter 20, like we just read, the Bible says, remember the Sabbath because God is the creator. But did you know that the Bible repeats the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5? In Deuteronomy chapter 5, we see a repeating of the Ten Commandments. Starting in verse 12, the Bible says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And it goes on and lists the same things 
Don't make anybody work for you. Don't make your animals work for you. But notice this difference. It's very key difference. Why does God command us to keep the Sabbath in Deuteronomy 5? Why? It says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Egypt in the Bible is used as a, like a symbol for sin, a symbol for slavery. In Revelation 11, it's used for a symbol of atheism, actually. God commands us to keep the Sabbath for them because they were slaves in Egypt, for us because we were slaves to sin. If we read in Romans 6, the Bible says you are slaves to what you obey. And if that's sin, then you're a slave to sin. Now, moving along with the same line of thought of freedom from keeping the Sabbath because of freedom from sin. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 20. And reading in verse 12, the Bible says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Now the context of Ezekiel 20 shows us that this is the Ten Commandments Sabbath that is being talked about here. It's not the feast days, which were also referred to as Sabbaths. The context here shows us that uh, God was calling Israel to the carpet for their many instances of breaking the Ten Commandments. So in, in verse 12, it says that the Sabbath, it's talking about the weekly Sabbath, is a sign between God and us that he sanctifies us. So sanctification is the process of becoming free from sin. And so we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 5, and the Bible says, Remember, you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, the Lord your God commands you to keep the Sabbath holy, because it is the sign that God sanctifies us. It is the sign that he has set us free from sin. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20, it says, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So the Sabbath is a sign that God sanctifies us, which is the process of being free from sin. And it's also the sign that God is our God. Well, you may say, well, that's all Old Testament. Well, I want you to notice something very key in Isaiah. We'll turn back a couple of books in the Bible to Isaiah. And this is still an Old Testament book, obviously. But this is a future New Testament prophecy. The Bible says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I shall make, uh, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. So God here is telling us, even though it's an Old Testament book, in Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23, that in the new earth, after God has destroyed sin and sinners and they are no more, in the new earth, we will be keeping the Sabbath when everything is perfect. My friends, in the new earth, there, you know, there will be no need for man's laws. You know, the ceremonial law was abolished at the cross. There's no, been no need for that for centuries now. But in heaven, it says the Sabbath will still be there. So the Sabbath was not done away with. Let's look in Jeremiah 31. The Bible says, Behold, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And God goes on to say that this is the covenant that I will make. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Now you may say, well, that's Old Testament. Okay, fine, let's turn to the New Testament. Let's look. Hebrews chapter 8 quotes directly from the passage we just read in Jeremiah 31. Always let the Bible explain itself, my friends. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8, quoting from Jeremiah 31, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. So we see this pattern of God writing his law on our hearts. You see, that's been the whole goal of God all along, is to write his law on our hearts, because his law is his character. Now, many people will turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, and quote that and say, John says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, so John was in the Spirit on Sunday. No, that's not what it says. It says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, but let's see what the Bible defines as the Lord's day. In Matthew 12, verse 8, Jesus himself is speaking here. And he says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He doesn't say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. He says Sabbath. Now let's look at another New Testament reference that says the exact same thing. In Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of 
the Sabbath. So you see, um, a lot of people will quote Mark 2.27 and say, see, the Sabbath was made for men. That, that means it's just for the Jews. But hang on a second. If it was just for the Jews, it would say the Sabbath was made just for the Jews. That, but that's not at all what it says. It says the Sabbath was made for man. Now, hang on. You're thinking, uh, you may be saying, well, the Bible says in Acts 20, verse 7, uh, that on the first day of the week, the, the disciples came together to break bread, and Paul preached until midnight. See, they kept Sunday. No, they actually didn't. Because in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says each new day begins when? At sundown. So this would likely have been a Saturday night. Just notice what it says. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Paul was getting ready to depart on a Sunday morning, but he was preaching until midnight. He went. He was a very long-winded preacher. All it's saying is it was a Saturday night service. That's all it's saying. It's not saying um, Sunday at all. Uh, in fact, while a lot of people do claim that uh, the Bible says that the early church met on Sunday, the Bible never says any such thing. However, the book of Acts 84 times records the early church and the early church apostles as keeping Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath. It never once records them as keeping Sunday. Now you may be thinking, what about Romans 6? Romans 6 says we're not under the law, we're under grace. Yeah, it does say that. But we always have to look at the context and see what the context says. So Romans 6 14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. But notice the immediate context. Verse 15 says, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. If you look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible says sin is the transgression of the law, which means if there is no law, there is no sin. But however, Paul is saying here, shall we sin because we're not under the law? Remember, this was written decades after the cross. Paul saying, shall we sin? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And if we read Romans 6, verse 1, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. If we look at Romans chapter 3, the end of Romans chapter 3, it says, Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Paul here is not saying that we don't have to obey the law. Revelation twenty two fourteen says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to enter into the tree of life. You're not going to heaven if you reject God's law and don't repent of it. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's just what the Bible says. It's the truth, whether we like it or not. Paul was not saying we're not uh, to obey the law. He was saying that we're not condemned by the law. Why? Because we're under grace. How are we under grace? Because we have accepted the salvation that Jesus has offered us. That's what puts us under grace and not under the condemnation of the law. That is what Paul was talking about. He was not saying, don't obey the law anymore. It doesn't matter. He was not saying that. He was saying, you guys, we've accepted Jesus. We've accepted his salvation. We're under grace. We're not condemned by the law. But just because we're not condemned by the law doesn't mean we get to continue in sin. Because again, notice the context of Romans chapter 6. Paul is saying, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Over and over again, we see this in Paul's writings. Now, if you watched my video the other night for um, uh, why Jesus is not our Sabbath, you'll know in Hebrews 4, that Paul talks about resting in Christ. And we see that concept of resting in Christ and how it's absolutely necessary to our salvation because we cannot earn our salvation. But Paul also talks about in that chapter how resting in Christ is directly connected to the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day from his works. Paul, later on in the same chapter, says, Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. In James chapter 2, the Bible says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? There are people, there are a surprising amount of people that believe Abraham never kept the Sabbath. That they believe nobody before Moses kept the Sabbath. But my friends, that's just not true. The Bible says here that Abraham was justified by works as well as his faith. It's not that his works earned him anything. They absolutely did not. 
but his works testified to his faith. God is speaking of Abraham in Genesis 26, verse 5. It says, Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. God knew that he could trust Abraham to do what God needed him and called him to do. So you see, anybody who tells you that the Sabbath is no longer necessary is either deceived or is lying to you. The Sabbath is very much necessary for salvation, not because, not, not to earn salvation, but because it shows you have it. Proper Sabbath observance shows that you already have accepted the salvation that Jesus has offered you. So the Sabbath is also not a doctrine of demons, like uh, a certain Greg Locke, who calls himself a pastor, says. You see, in Acts chapter 20, verse 29, the Bible says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. You see, Greg Locke is the sort of pastor that Paul warned us about here. He is a savage wolf that is coming in to destroy the flock. And I don't say that lightly. Feel free to send this video to him uh, because I'm not going to say this behind someone's back. I don't believe in calling them a wolf behind their back. This is a public forum, so feel free to send this video to Greg Locke. Greg Locke, you are a wolf in sheep's clothing. You are a false teacher, and you need to repent of your false teachings. Uh, Jesus is coming soon. There is still time for you to be forgiven. 